Welcome to John Gets Games. This is my impressions vlog for November 2018, and normally I would cover all of the new games that I played over this last month, but I went to Board Game Geek Con a couple weeks ago, and I played 26 new games at that convention, so I decided to bundle those up into a two-part impressions vlog series, and I've already posted that, so you can click the little I in the top corner if you want to check those out, or just search for them on the channel. But here in this vlog, I will be covering the eight other games that I played this month uh, that were new to me while not at that convention. Now, before before we move on, I would like to briefly ask that if you enjoy this video, you please consider clicking the like button down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Also, if you would like to directly support the channel and the creation of videos like this one in the future, then please go to johngetsgames.com support to see a variety of ways with which you could do that, including voting on uh, playthroughs that I film each month. Now, without further ado, let's jump into the list. The first game I'll be covering here is Counterfeiters. Now, this one is a recent publication by Quinted Games. I believe they launched this at Essen Spiel just a month ago or so, and I was interested in this game for a couple different reasons, and I was able to grab a media copy to try. Now, uh, those reasons are, well, three real reasons. The first is that the art is stunning. It's got just a beautiful cover on the front. Uh, I know that Ian O'Toole did um, the art for this game, and he definitely does a great job with this stuff. Um, also, just the components um, look great. They have this big, chunky workers that that you're putting out there, even though everything fits into a pretty small box. Now, the second reason I was interested in this game is because I knew that it was a worker placement game, but I also heard that it was supposed to be very light and very quick. Um, supposedly like a 25 to 30 minute worker placement uh, game, and that is unusual. Like, I haven't seen many of those, so I was curious to see what that was about. And the third thing had to do with the central premise of this game, which is you are making counterfeit money, and then you need to launder that into real money, and at the end of the game, your score is how much money you were able to to, um, hold on to once the game is over. Now, when it comes into the actual play of the game, uh, it's a pretty um, straightforward worker placement experience. You have three workers, and you're going to put them out onto spots, and if somebody went there already, then you can't go there. And the spots let you do things like make um, counterfeit money. Uh, you can also upgrade your process by getting, you know, holograms that you can add into your counterfeit uh, stuff, as well as um, uh, different things like that. You draft these cards from black market, and you spend some money for those, and it might give you more printers so that when you go to print more money, you print even more of these counterfeit uh, bills. And so you're trying to put all these things together to uh, have these counterfeits. And the counterfeit bills come in one, two, and three star varieties. Now, the better a counterfeit it is, the more stars it has, and uh, the more money you should be able to launder this into as you're playing the game. Now, there are several locations out on this small player board where if you do that worker placement action, it will move this uh, police pawn down a track. And that track is the uh, timer for the entire game. The game ends once the police band hits the very end, and as the game goes on, it's going to be harder to launder your money at the easy places like the shopping market. Uh, the police are starting to catch on to uh, your specific types of counterfeits, so um, once you get about a third of the way through the game, you cannot launder your single star uh, bills there anymore, and for the last chunk of the game, you can't actually launder anything at the uh, the grocery store. They, they know about your counterfeits, but you can still do things like um, uh, do some... Uh, there are other ways to launder your money. I can't remember the name of the specific spot, that's not the grocery store. But another thing you have to consider is that there is this godfather figure. And whenever the uh, police uh, token hits a spot on the uh, track that shows the godfather, then everybody is going to lose half of their money. Now, because of that, you want to try and hide your money so you can fly to the Caribbean and stash your money, I guess, in some uh, foreign bank and then come on back. And now you don't have access to that money, so you can't use that money to buy more pieces to your engine. But you also have it safe away from the godfather. Now, for the most part, that is the game. Uh, we played this one at, I believe, three players, and it went relatively well. I mean, there was no real moment of like, oh, that's cool, or oh, that's interesting and new. It was just, you know, straightforward worker placement mechanics as we were just laundering tons of money. Now, it was a little bit strange. Uh, you have this paper money that you are playing with, and in the three-player game, we ran out of money. Uh, we had just uh, been able to launder so much of our counterfeits into the actual real bills that we had to do a little bit of proxying there at the very end of the game, and I went back and I read the rules a couple times. They're are, are quite short to double check that I wasn't doing something wrong, but it seemed like we just were able to build some pretty good engines, and I think that maybe we were not pressing the policeman hard enough when we thought that our opponents were going to, um, uh, when you get uh, would get over to the, specifically the Godfather spot to force your opponents to lose half their money. It's hidden how much money they have, and I think we all played very safely until we were all able to get all of our money into the Caribbean before the Godfather pawn actually 
actually hit that spot. So overall, it was fine. Um, I don't really find myself particularly interested in coming back to it. I don't think I will play this one again. I guess at the end of the day, it is a quick worker placement game. I think our play was probably more like 40 to 45 minutes as we were going, uh, checking the rule book a couple times to make sure we weren't doing something wrong because we just had so much money we were doing so well. Uh, but yeah, overall, it, it seems to fulfill what it was trying to do, but I was hoping to find something special in there and I didn't really see anything like that. Moving on, we now have game number two, and this one is Q-Birds. Now, I had not heard about this game at all uh, going into Essenspiel, but I had a planned meeting at BlackRock, uh, the distributor, and they were showing me a bunch of games, and they showed me this one, and it sounded pretty interesting, so I was able to get a press copy of it. Now, uh, right off the bat, the first thing you'll probably notice is the adorable art. Uh, this game is called Q-Birds, which is like cube birds. <laughs> so you have these like very uh, rectangular shaped looking birds and I just love the art aesthetic to these birds. But mechanically what you're doing in this game is an um, interesting bit of set collection and push your luck. So out in the middle of the table you have these four rows of birds and every single row has to have at least two bird types. Now there are eight different types of birds in the game and everybody has a hand of cards and when it's your turn you have to choose all of one type of bird from your hand and play it down either to the uh, left or the right of one of the rows that are in the middle of the table. Now, if when you place those birds down, you have put them into a uh, row that already has one of that same type of bird, then you're gonna take all of the birds that are between the two like types. So if, for instance, if a row has this skinny bird here and then a toucan and a parrot, and then you put two more skinny birds on the end, then you'd get to take everything between the skinny birds. So I guess they kind of land on this line and all the other birds fly off into your hand. So I would get that toucan and that parrot into my hand, and then all those skinny birds would just kind of line out there all in a nice uh, collected um, pack out there on the line. Now, you always have to have at least two birds on a line, so if there's just one, then you draw randomly from the top. And so what that means is you are constantly trying to play your cards out in such a way to get the right birds into your hand because at the end of every turn, you can um, uh, cash in one flock of birds. And if you look at the cards, they have uh, two numbers, a small flock number and a large flock number. And that's just the number of those uh, birds you have to have in your hand. So what this means is it's it's quite puzzling because you never draw randomly into your hand as you're playing the game. Uh, at the beginning of each round, you will get a random hand of eight cards, it's true. But in the middle of the round, you just have to play with what you have in the middle. So what that means is if there are a couple birds out there that you really need to make that set in your hand, but you don't have any other birds that match that row, then you look to other rows and maybe you find, oh, okay, um, there's a skinny bird up here and I don't have one in my hand. So I will play a different card to pick up those skinny birds into my hand so that next turn I will have the skinny birds to place those down and pick up the actual birds that I want. So you are planning a couple turns ahead trying to get the resources that you need to unlock um, the birds that you actually really want. And there is a push your luck aspect to this game because at any moment, if any one person has played all of their cards, then the round ends and everybody has to ditch their entire hand. So what that means is you have to make sure that you are not uh, playing it too safe trying to build these gigantic flocks because if somebody just cashes out all their cards suddenly, which I have seen happen, uh, they suddenly just put all five cards down and you're like, oh, the round's over and you just lose like three turns worth of progress because you were just pushing it like a little bit too hard. Now, of course, in that situation, maybe you thought that you were safe and suddenly you were not, but you have to go into this game knowing that that situation can happen. And I'm okay with that. And I've played this game twice now. Uh, the first game was at two players and the second game was at three players. And I really liked it at two players. It was a you know, very tit for tat experience as you were uh, uh, placing things down and only one person plays, then you get to go right back in. And it was a pretty close uh, game in that respect. And I lost that that one game. And I walked away from it thinking, that was a cute game. Like, I really dug the um, the kind of ideas going on here, the ebb and flow of the rounds, the uh, puzzle of trying to work with the stuff that I have to get the stuff that I need to get the things that are really going to give me points. Now, the game is going to keep going until one player has seven out of the eight birds cashed in as flocks in front of themselves, or if somebody has up to uh, three or more of two different types of birds. So it does not last very long. I think uh, the two-player game was probably 20 minutes, and the three-player game was probably about that, honestly. Maybe 25 minutes or so, because um, it's a relatively quick playing game. But overall, I've been pretty impressed by this. I mean, I've played it twice because I liked it the first time and I brought it uh, the next week to the next uh, game night that I went to. And it's a very small box and I can see myself continuing to slide this in uh, to my bag as I go to um, uh, game nights because it doesn't take up much space. It's a pretty decent little filler style game and it's somewhat interactive with cute art and good decisions. It just has a lot of stuff that I like and I'm looking forward to playing this one more. 
Next up, we have game number three, and this one is Forum Trajanum. Now, this is um, one of two games that Stefan Feld has uh, come out with over the course of this year. Uh, the other one is Carpe Diem, and I actually covered that one in the part one of my Board Game Geek Con impressions, so you can check that one out if you like. But specifically, with respect to Forum Trajanum, this is very much a classic style uh, um, Stefan Feld game, because many of his games just give you points for doing all sorts of things, and this one is no exception. Now, right off the bat, if you are familiar with Stefan Feld's games, you will know that he... Uh, um, I designed a game that came out six or so years ago called Trajan, and this game is called Forum Trajanum. And honestly, the, the first thing everybody asks is, oh, is it a sequel or is it similar? It's not the same at all. I haven't played tra uh, Trajan at this point, but I know about how you play that one, and that's a very Moncala-style game, and this one has nothing to do with any of that. It's just a thematic connection. Now, there are a lot of steps to this game. It's a very strange experience, and I remember when it first got announced, I tried to read the rules, and I got about halfway through the rules, and had no idea how this game worked. So I kind of put it to the side and said, well, maybe I just don't care. Uh, a week or two later, I decided to try the rules again, and I read the whole thing and got to the end and decided I still had no real idea of how this game actually played. Uh, so I took that um, as reason enough to say, well, maybe this game just won't be for me, and I just did, proceeded to ignore it. After that, I flew out to uh, Spiel, and then while there, I actually got to watch uh, Rado's run-through of this game, and once I got to see Rado playing it, I got to see the ebb and flow of the turns, I realized... Hey, that looks pretty cool, actually. That makes a lot of sense now. So I was able to talk to Stronghold Games and pick up a press copy of this one. Uh, so that's a lot of preamble before I start talking about how it plays. Uh, so let's jump into that. Now, everybody is going to randomly put out all of these uh, tiles in their color in a big grid in front of themselves. And every single turn, you are going to be dictated on two of these tiles that you will randomly draw and then see the other side to. Now, there are rows and columns in this um, uh, grid in front of yourself, and you draw two cards, and they say, you know... Um, draw one token from the row with the bridge. And another one might say, draw one token from the row with the bathhouse. So once you do that, you don't know what's going to be on the backside of these tiles. They will. There are a variety of different bonuses, uh, like bonus resources or abilities. Um, but realistically, you're going to try to pull these off in such a way to leave gaps in your area because you're going to fill those gaps in with various buildings. It's a bit of tiling going on there. So now you have these two tiles and you get to look at the new side, the, the side of them and you decide which one of them you want to activate. And then you give the other one to your player on your right. That means you're going to get one from the player on your uh, left, and then when it's your turn, you will choose one of those two tiles to evaluate. So you might not even use the one that you picked, uh, because the one that gets passed to you might be slightly better, but this always means that you will have a decent amount of control over one of these two options. Now again, these are going to give you resources in a variety of different ways, and then what you will do is you have to um, try to build things out into your area, and you do that by spending different colored workers that match up with different colors buildings. Now, if I build a single red building into my um, area in front of me, then that means I can then send um, an emissary, I think they're called, uh, uh, one of your uh, pieces that you have now used in the past um, that you flipped over. You can now send that to the middle of the table and then try to get some points by um, doing some bit of area uh, control. Um, you're trying to keep your pieces adjacent to each other because you'll score points for that. You're also trying to block your opponents out so that uh, they can't put their pieces adjacent to each other. There is some color matching things that you're doing there, and honestly, if I keep talking about the specifics of this, it's not going to do you any uh, justice for the game. It won't make sense. Uh, but just so you know, this game is all about doing the best you can with these two random things that you just pulled up, then trying to build out the buildings in your own tableau. You're going to score four times throughout the game, and every time you play, there will be different scoring objectives, and it has to do with the adjacency of the different colored buildings that are in your area. And then you also score bonus points for these uh, specific rows that have different colored gray buildings, so you're trying to keep that in mind, while you're also trying to uh, match out in the middle of the board, keeping all of your people close together, but also having them next to scoring locations and blocking other people. There are also tracks that you are following in this game, there's just quite a lot actually going on, even though when you are playing it, it seems to go along at a decent pace. Um, the, the When you are in each one of these individual phases, they make sense, although altogether it can definitely feel overwhelming. Um, there's like a, a score modifier slider track on top of your board that will modify not only how you get some end game bonus, uh, some end of round bonuses, but also um, give you extra points for having clusters of people. Just everything seems to feed back into everything else, and all of these things give you victory points. Now, I played this one once, and I believe we played it at four players, 
and I dominated this game. I uh, won by, I don't know, like 30 or 40 points. I had a score of, I think, 140 or something like that. It was a really big um, advantage over even, I think, the second place person. And then the other three people were all pretty close. And I think a big part of that is because as I said, you are trying to match these end of round scoring objectives for the patterns of stuff in your player area. And I really follow those. I did the best I could to uh, activate those. And then the number of points you get for those depends on this sliding point modifier. So I really focused on sliding the point modifier over. So I got more points for every time I satisfied the conditions that happened in each one of the scorings. And that worked out really well for me. And I don't think my opponents paid as much attention to that because again, there are a lot of different things that that you need to be paying attention to as you are playing the game. So at the end of it, it seemed like there was a lukewarm to positive experience uh, or um, uh, impressions coming off of the other people around the table. Uh, I quite enjoyed it, but I also won by a significant amount, so I didn't feel much frustration there. Uh, but one thing I did walk away from the game uh, with feeling was that I don't really get the game quite yet, even though I did very well. I feel like I am looking forward to trying this one several more times to try and figure it out a little bit more. It's like it was a pleasurable uh, experience overall, but it didn't necessarily blow me away. I liked all the things I was doing, and obviously I did it pretty well. Uh, but I do need to try this one uh, more in the future to see if maybe I just liked it because things kind of fell uh, uh, in a good way for me or because I made some really good decisions. It did seem like there was maybe a little bit more going on than I necessarily would have liked going into it, but it's a Stefan Feld game, and he does that in a lot of his games, so as long as you know that going in, then that's um, something good. So I've heard really good things about this game from other people, and I'm happy to say that I enjoyed it overall, although, again, it didn't necessarily blow my socks off, but I am looking forward to digging into this one more in the future. All right, let's now move on to game number four, and this one is The Little Monster That Came for Lunch and Stayed for Tea. Now, that is an adorable and very long name, so I usually just call it Little Monster. And this is a lightweight um, set collection uh, hand management style game where you are trying to race your little monsters around a banquet table. Uh, now, what you do on your turn is you are always going to draw a food card into your hand at the start of every turn, and then if you have um, 15 or more food value in the, the, the food in your hand, Hand, then you can play those cards out. And then you have this tricky little thing where if you play more than 15 value, then you have to uh, flip over one of the cards you just played. Um, and if you are still at over 15, then that card comes back to your hand. Uh, but if you are now under 15, then you get to evaluate all of the actions on the cards that are face up now, but not the one that you flipped over. So what that means is you can um, get over uh, 15 if you want to, which is the threshold that you need to be, and then flip over a card that has an action that would actually help out your opponents. So you want to try and flip that over and not evaluate it. Now, whenever you get over 15, that you are feeding one of your monsters and they get to move forward one space around the table, but there are a variety of other ways for them to move forward. Uh, lots of the cards have actions on them that say things like, um, the uh, your fastest monster does this, or the slowest monster does that, and you are trying to uh, work around that, well, there's also this crowd of other monsters that are rushing around the table. Now, a big selling factor to this game has to do with the asymmetries. Now, at the start of the game, you randomly grab two monsters monsters from this, um, this stack, there are a lot of them, and they give you um, different rules. Each monster has its own uh, subtle tweak on the game. Uh, some of them give you uh, something at the start of every turn. Some of them give you conditional benefits. Other ones uh, say things like, well, one of them says you can't feed it until you discard 20 food value worth of cards, but then they move twice. So that's a little bit more efficient, even though you have to hoard a bunch of cards to make that happen. Now, um, that's a big selling point for the game because you have variety of play, because when you sit down and play it a second time, you'll get get completely different monsters and probably uh, play things slightly differently. Now, when it comes to the experience itself, I... I found the game to be cute. Uh, I, I liked the uh, action combos that we were doing with the cards that we were playing. Uh, oftentimes you could play a bunch of cards and like this will cause you to draw cards, then move this forward, and then move one of yours back to launch another one forward a couple spaces, and you're trying to do things in such a way that uh, some of the conditions happen. Like if a card says, if you're, you know, move your fastest monster, but both of your monsters are on the same spot, then neither of them are fastest, so you can't do it. So maybe you want to play a different card that lets you move one of them uh, backwards or forward first so that you 
now have a fastest monster so that you can activate those other things. So you're trying to chain all these things together, and I think that's the core of the gameplay that they were going for. But at the same time, this is a game where you're just drawing blind from the top of the deck at the beginning of every one of your turns. And I did see several um, occasions where people just were kind of drawing blind from the top of the deck like three or four turns in a row without playing anything out because they kept drawing really low value cards and they couldn't even get up to the 15 uh, threshold to be able to feed one of their monsters and move them. While there are cards in the, the deck go, that go from one all the way up to nine, so then there were other people who seemed to draw, you know, two cards and then that would get them over 15 and they'd play them out and they'd move. Now, uh, from a design perspective, I was expecting that those high value cards would be the least powerful and the low value cards would be the most powerful when it comes to the actions that you're playing, and it seemed like, in general, that was sort of true, although one of the more powerful cards of the game, I think, was a six uh, that seemed to be allow you to move your monsters like crazy, and we couldn't help but shake the feeling when we uh, finished that second play of the game that some of the actions felt like they should have been paired with different numbers, and, you know, we've only played the game twice, uh, so not an exhaustive uh, data set by any means, but um, overall, I think the game did deliver what it was asking, uh, what it was uh, promising anyway. It was a lightweight game of like doing combo-y card type of action type of things. I feel like maybe if some of the cards um, were balanced slightly differently, I would probably enjoy it more. Uh, I'm not sure where I am at it with uh, with future plays. Um, I'm not, uh, I've not decided to get rid of it at this point. Um, I do think it has adorable artwork and the asymmetries between the monsters is cute. Uh, so I could see myself um, bringing this one out and playing it again at some point in the future. Uh, but I don't think I'm necessarily excited to make that happen, unfortunately. Next up, we have game number five, and this one is Spring Meadow. Now, the designer of this game is Uwe Rosenberg, and he's been on a bit of a uh, Tetris puzzle piece design kick over the last few years. Uh, last year, he came out with Indian Summer, and I think one or two years before that, um, Cottage Garden came out. Uh, obviously, A Feast Roden is a huge Euro game with this mechanic, and Patchwork came out even before that, which was a two-player only game. But specifically, Spring Meadow is uh, being branded as the third game in a trilogy where you have Cottage Garden, Indian Summer, and then Spring Meadow. Now, I thought Cottage Garden was fine. I think it was a bit more complex than it really needed to be. I thought Indian Summer was honestly awful. I, I really thought that it was just a waste of cardboard in a box. It was a really unfun game. It almost wasn't even a game, but uh, so when I moved on to um, Spring Meadow, I had very low expectations because I was so disappointed by Indian Summer. In fact, I uh, because of that, I didn't even ask for a copy of this game. Uh, I went to the Spielweiss booth at Essen Spiel um, specifically to get a copy of The Boldest, and they just threw a copy of uh, Spring Meadow at me at the same time, and I was like, well, I guess I'll go ahead and try it. So at at this point, I've now played the game twice, and I'm happy to say that this is easily the best of this trilogy right here. Um, I don't know if I can necessarily compare it to Patchwork, because they are significantly different games, but I can um, very joyfully say that Spring Meadow is a fun game. Now, um, let's talk about how it works. So everybody has a board in front of themselves with a bunch of snow on it, and you are going to be playing the game grabbing these little meadow tiles, which effectively show you melting the snow back. Now, the uh, rules restrictions for putting these tiles down are really open. You can put it anywhere on the board. It doesn't have to be adjacent to other tiles or anything like that. The only exception is you can't cover up these little uh, burrow holes on the uh, board unless you are able to um, do a special thing. And I'm not going to talk about all the specifics, but for the most part, you can put these tiles down pretty much wherever you want to. Now, when it comes to scoring, you are only going to score all of your complete rows from the uh, closest to you spot all the way forward until you get to your first incomplete row where you'll get one point for a thing on that first incomplete row. So what you're doing on this game is you have this board in the middle of the table and there is this um, flag thing that moves around the board and it's very similar to um, Cottage Garden in the way this works. And you simply grab one of the tiles that is associated with the row when it's your turn and you put it down into your area. And you keep going until at the start of any one person's turn, there is zero or one tile available to themselves. And then you do a scoring. You just count up and see how, it, how good everybody has been at um, filling out all these rows, and then the person who did the best gets a little token. The first person to get two tokens wins the game. Now, um, all that stuff works really well, but the big reason why I like this game is because it incorporates a um, design innovation that Indian Summer brought in, where some of these tiles, actually most of these tiles that you place, have holes in the tile. Now, a big reason I was upset with Indian Summer is that it had this cool idea of tiles with holes in them, and the things that were um, that showed the whole um, showed that icon through the hole when you placed it on your board gave you various bonus bonuses. And 
and it seemed like such a waste of a cool idea in Indian Summer. And I think I remember at the end of the, um, when I talked about that one in my impressions vlog last time, I said that I really wished that this um, whole mechanic was going to be used better. And I'm really happy to say that it seems like uh, Spring Meadow does it really well. So what you're trying to do in Spring Meadow is you're trying to build out all of these tiles, trying to make complete rows, but you are also trying to align these holes with the burrow holes on the board because that will give you a couple bonuses with some extra points and some flexibility. But also you're trying to line these holes up to be orthogonally adjacent to other holes. Now the reason you're doing that is because whenever you match those up next to each other, you'll get bonus tiles in the form of rocks that you can then put out on the board and they start out rather small and they are really good at filling in all the little gaps that your um, puzzling has produced. Now what this means is you have a tile line game on top of a tile line game where you're trying to uh, match all of these pieces in to fit with the holes that you have, um, sorry, with, fit with the gaps that you have on your board, while also trying to position the holes on the tiles that you're placing so that you can extend out um, larger contiguous groups of adjacent holes. Because the bigger that group is, the larger the piece of rock that you can put down onto your board. And this really is just a race to fill these rows as fast as you can before all of your opponents. So yeah, altogether, this game came together really well. I've played it twice at this point. I enjoyed both of those plays. I don't see myself getting rid of this one. I think this one might be a, a decent uh, standby filler for, you know, playing up to four people for, you know, 25 to 30 or so minutes with some decent puzzly action as you're trying to work all this stuff together. It seemed like a very honed in, um, clean version of uh, the mechanics that they were going for. Honestly, it seems like uh, all of the mistakes that were made in Indian Summer were rectified with this game of Spring Meadow. So yeah, overall, I am super happy with it. I think it's, it's pretty cute. I think Indian Summer was a prettier overall game. I kind of wish the Indian Summer aesthetics were over here in Spring Meadow, but I'm not going to complain about that one too much. Overall, it's a really decent game and I'm looking forward to playing it more. Let's now move on to game number six, and this one is The River. Now, this one is the most recent publication by Days of Wonder Games. Uh, they put out things like uh, Yamatai and uh, Small World, and it seems like in general they put out one game a year, and this is the publication that they have come out most recently. Now, this is a uh, definite entry-level worker placement style game with um, some nice art and a couple neat twists, and that was enough for me to be interested in trying this game out. Now, from a worker placement perspective, you have a set number of workers, uh, but actually they're not set because because as you're playing the game, you can unlock uh, an additional worker, but you also have to start to sequester away and lose your workers once you build out your uh, river establishment. Now, um, as you're playing this game, every person has a tableau in front of themselves with a board, and it has a snaking river on it, and as you're playing the game, you're going to be picking up new tiles, and you have to add them onto your river in the order of the river, you kind of build it out, and the farther along you go, the more workers you're going to lose to actually maintain that river, but whenever you do any of the resource acquisition worker placement spots, and that's one of the main things you do in this game. Like, for instance, if you go onto a spot to gather stone, then you look down to your board and you count up all of the stone icons on all of the uh, areas that you have, and that's the amount of stone that you get, and then you have to store that on these storage facilities that are also here on your river. Now, all of the boards have um, starting stone and storage locations on them, but as you play the game and you draft new tiles to put onto your river that you build, those tiles are much more powerful than the basic ones on your board, so you are going to build a bigger and better engine, while while you of course have to start losing your workers for the rest of the game to actually um, maintain the size of your river. Now, um, when it comes to what you are trying to uh, get at the end of the game, it's victory points. Uh, you are uh, gathering these resources to cash them in to construct various buildings, uh, and the game will end on a couple different conditions, and once it's over, you just count up the points you got for the buildings that you made by cashing in all these resources, but then you'll also get a decent amount of points for some pattern matching of the columns of your river area, as well as some tiles in your river that will just give you end game victory points. So it's a pretty straightforward gaming, uh, worker placement gaming experience. Uh, you know, you have interaction as you go to spots that your opponents want to go to, but when you're trying to gather resources, everybody can go to those locations. The biggest restrictor is the fact that there is only a set amount of each resource in the game. So that means if you need stone and there's only one or two stone left over because everybody else is hoarding it, then maybe you should do something else and wait for somebody to spend their stone so that you can go back over there and grab it. Now, I mentioned early on that this is an entry-level gateway style game, and because of that, I think that it's not necessarily targeted at me. I have played many hundreds of different games, and I think that my impression of this game once I finished it up was that it was fine. I enjoyed it, I had fun, I didn't win, but I think I was in the middle of the pack and I could see myself playing this one again, but I can't necessarily see myself 
wanting to come back to it a lot. And I think that is because it's pretty simple and pretty straightforward. Now, if the only games I had played ever were like Stone Age and Settlers of Catan, then I think uh, sitting down to play The River would be very exciting. And I think I would really enjoy it because, you know, obviously Stone Age is a worker placement game that does uh, very different things. And I won't talk about that right now, but you have dice rolling and that kind of thing. But you also are acquiring resources to spend them to get points. And in this game, you have different kind of engine building stuff that you're doing. So it will feel familiar but significantly different to people who are entering the hobby with a much smaller um, experience set for games. And I think that for that entry-level position, the river is really well positioned. I think it is a uh, really solid design overall. Um, I might end up playing it uh, again in the future. Uh, I might keep this one around to specifically play it with people who are not as familiar with um, uh, modern board games and the wide variety that are out there. But I guess for me personally, it doesn't really have a spark that's going to make me actively want to keep playing this one. Next up, we have game number seven, and this one is Underwater Cities, and I am quite excited to talk about this game. Now, uh, for a little bit of background information, the designer of this game is Vladimir Sushi or Suhi, I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce his name, but he's designed games like um, Pulsar 2849, as well as Last Will and The Prodigals Club, and a couple of the games that I have not played. Now, all of these games are uh, medium to heavyweight-ish, but mostly medium weight Euro-style games, and I have enjoyed the games that he's made in the past. I thought Pulsar was fine, and I thought the Prodigals Club was excellent. Uh, so that was enough for me to be interested in checking out Underwater Cities. Uh, but then also when I looked into it more, I found out that um, it was being published by Delicious Games, which is a brand new publisher. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's um, the uh, designer and his wife uh, together who started this game, uh, this uh, publishing company. Uh, so I then became a little bit reticent, like, you know, how is this going to actually turn out? Like a first-time publisher, will it even look good with decent art? And then once I started seeing photos come out, um, all of those fears went away because I actually think the artistic aesthetic in this game is wonderful. They have a ton of different artwork on the cards, but either way, uh, that's enough preamble. <laughs> I was able to get a uh, review copy of this one at Essence Spiel for a discount. I, I paid, you know, about one third of the cost to grab this copy and play it. And um, I guess I'm just going to start off by saying that this might be the best game that I've played this year. It is... <sighs> It is just so good. All right, so the mechanics of this game. It's a worker placement style game where uh, you always have three workers which come in the form of these little action tokens. And out on the board, there are three different zones of spots that you can go onto. You have a red zone, a yellow zone, and a green zone. Now, everybody also always has a hand of three or maybe more cards, depending on how things go. And every turn, you have to place one of your action tokens down onto a spot that nobody else has gone to, and then you have to play a card. Now, if the card you play matches the color of the spot that you just um, put an action token onto, then you not only get to do the action on the board, but you get to evaluate that card. If those two don't match, then you get to do the action on the board, but you just discard the card and you don't evaluate it. So obviously, you are very motivated to try and evaluate actions that match the cards that you're playing, and there are so many cards in this game. You play through three eras, and each era has a deck of like this big, and as you get into the later eras, the cards get more powerful. And on this game, in this game, at the end of each turn, you're going to draw a card back into your hand, so there's a bit of randomness as you are filling your hand back up, and there are other ways to draw cards as well. But what this game forces you to to do is think tactically, like this turn, I want to have a really good turn, best utilizing the actions that are available to myself, as well as the actions on my cards, but also strategically because many of these cards that you're placing are engine building style cards. They might um, give you uh, conditional bonuses depending on you matching certain things on the board. Uh, they might um, multiply things for you. They might give you end game victory points. Um, many of them are action cards, which you can then evaluate as um, kind of bonus additional actions when you go to certain spots out on the board. And then at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is build out this network of underwater cities in your player tableau with these little uh, plastic domes and little tunnels and all these little buildings that you're building next to them, like um, a, a kelp farm, because you need farm as uh, you need kelp as food to actually feed all your cities. Uh, you have a desalination plant to get you credits and you can spend money doing all sorts of things. Um, there's also laboratories that, that gives you science, which lets you upgrade all of these things so that you can do more stuff. Now, this is not a short game. <laughs> uh, you always play through 10 rounds, and um, in each one of those rounds, you take three worker placement actions. So you're going to take 30 actions throughout this game, and I have now played a uh, two-player game. Uh, no, sorry. I played a three-player game with friends, and then I filmed a full two-player playthrough of this one, and I posted it up on the channel. Uh, so if this already sounds interesting to you, then please go check out the uh, playthrough. I teach most of the rules to the game in the first 20 or so minutes, and it should get you a decent vibe of how it plays. 
Now, I... I absolutely loved both of these plays. At three players, it was wonderful. Um, our game took, I think, a little over two hours, maybe two hours and 15 minutes. Uh, I have no idea how long the two-player game takes because I filmed that one and it took quite a while to do that. But I can say that in both of these um, circumstances, while playing the game, I was just loving all of the decisions I was making. I really like the fact that you are drawing random cards into your hand that you are then trying to work together into the various strategies that you've already been building out. You are drawing so many cards throughout the game that even though some of the cards you will draw will just not work at all for what you're doing, many of them will, and they will kind of um, have you going in different directions that you didn't even think of. Like, you might play a card from your hand because it matches the color of the spot you want to go to, not even really caring about that card, but now it's played out and it's in your tableau, and a few turns later you realize, wait a minute, I can actually do that. Like, that card gives me a bonus when I build my second farm in a city, and I wasn't really planning on doing that, but now that I have that bonus just sitting out there because I played it a few turns ago, I may as well do it. So I'll play that second farm and I'll get a bonus. Maybe it's an extra steal and I could use that to do various other things. So the way all this stuff bounces around is incredibly satisfying on a tactical and strategic level. And I, I found myself walking away from my first play of this feeling like it was kind of like Terraforming Mars, the worker placement game. You know, it had that Terraforming Mars vibe of just a gigantic stack of different um, uh, cards and effects. Uh, and you just draw through so many of them and you see so many as the game goes on and you try to piece them together into the, um, the different engines that you are making. So yeah, I think at this point, the, the biggest issue with the game is, is probably the length of play. I'm not sure if I'm ever going to play this one at four players. <laughs> when you play at four players, there's really no difference to the overall game clock. You still go through all 30 of the rounds. It just means that instead of, um, uh, sorry, all 10 of the rounds with the uh, each person taking 30 uh, actions, which means if you add a fourth person in, you're just adding 30 full turns to the game. And many of these turns, you are really crunching through the different decisions that you have to make. Uh, I've heard some horror stories already of uh, four player games of this going well over four hours. Um, I think that if everybody's familiar with the game, then you could probably play a four player game in under three hours. But with so much going on, I'm not sure if you would ever really crack the two hour mark, at least with the people that I play games with. But fortunately, it played really well at three and it played really well at two. So I think as far as a, a brilliant Euro game that I want to keep coming back to and I want to keep playing, I will just play this one in circumstances where there's two or one other person who wants to play it with me, and I'll just dissuade people from playing a four-player game. Uh, who knows, maybe someone will come out with a decent variant to shorten the overall game length a little bit for the four-player game to make that make a little bit more sense. But another aspect to this game is it's a worker placement game, which means when you go to a spot, nobody else can go there. So if you add a fourth person around the table, then that's even more plans being disrupted because you wanted to go on the spot and somebody went there, which means you now have to come up with a new plan to try and make all this stuff work. Uh, now, one thing I haven't even really talked about is the fact that three times throughout the game, you are going to do a production cycle where you just run all of your engine and all of your stuff makes even more stuff. And it's it's really interesting. When you start the game, you don't have much stuff and you can find yourself a couple turns in feeling really starved. But then if you've done things right, then after the first production phase, you're just sitting in front of a mountain of resources. And after the second production phase, an even bigger mountain. And you will find yourself burning through a lot of these to do a, very, a variety of different things. And the game definitely scales in a way to have you just doing more and more stuff as you get more and more stuff to do. And I think at this point, I'm kind of talking in circles. I don't have a whole lot more to say um, beyond the fact that uh, this game was exceptional. I, I see myself wanting to come back to this one for a long time in the future. It was just such a wonderful high of uh, decision making and, um, you know, interaction, indirect interaction with your opponents as they're working on certain strategies and you're gunning after other strategies. It's just such a good game. I've said that over and over again. So yeah, uh, potentially the best game that I've played overall this year. I think I need to play it a few more times and to try some other games out there because some good stuff has happened, but it's uh, it has an early lead, I suppose. Okay, at this point, we've now reached the eighth and final game I'll be talking about uh, in this vlog, and that one is Winner's Circle. Now, this game is not new. In fact, I think it came out, I didn't do my research, I think it came out in like 2000 seven, eight, nine, something like that. Uh, now, I got my uh, first copy of Winner's Circle back in 2009. Uh, it was actually a Christmas present. I think it was the third board game that I owned. I had uh, Dominion, and I had Stone Age, and then I got uh, this one, which is Winner's Circle. Uh, now, I played it a bunch way back in 2009, 2010, and then my, my copy got kind of beat up, and what's happening in this game is it's a horse racing game, and there are, I believe, seven horses that are racing around the track, and the copy that I had, well, a lot of the horses kind of looked 
looked pretty similar to each other. You had like black and then you had dark brown and then medium brown and then tan and then light tan and then white. And um, as you're playing this game, there were some times where you really had to pay attention to make sure you were moving the right horse. Now, I haven't played it really at all for many years at this point, uh, but I have fond memories of playing it. And also, my copy is missing a token here or there because it saw a lot of travel way back, you know, 10 years ago or so when I was playing this game a lot. So when I was at Essen Spiel this year, I, I saw that there is this uh, Korean board game publisher who was selling a new copy of this game that had pre-painted horse miniatures. And it was only 40 euros and... I decided to just do a splurge and let myself buy that one because I remembered enjoying this game so much way back when and a big issue with it was just the component quality. So now I have a copy of this game with all of these horses that are pre-painted, the jockeys are painted, there's a number printed on the back of the jockey shirt and the horse itself so you can easily match up and tell which horse does what. So yeah, I'm really happy I have this copy and I haven't talked about the mechanics of it at all yet. So uh, let's go into that briefly. Now, what you do in this game is you're going to play through three overall races. And at the start of the race, you're going to put these little uh, bid tokens down onto the various horses. Now, technically, if you play this game straight, then you're supposed to just put the bids face up on the horses so you know what everybody uh, wants and which horse they want everybody to go for. But the best way to play this game is with the bluffing variant, where you put your tokens down face down, and then one of the tokens you put is a zero. Now, you have a zero, two ones, and a two. And when the race is over, you score a certain number of money based off of... Uh, how well that, you, that horse placed at the end of the race, but also how many bets you put on it. So if you put a two down, then that's a double bet. Then you play through three races and whoever has the most points uh, money at the end of the game wins. In that third race, all money is doubled. So if you have a pretty poor first or second race, you at least have a shot at having a amazing third race and getting back into the fray of things. Now, when it comes to the mechanics of the race itself, once everybody has done all of the betting, then every person is going to, in turn order, when it's their turn, they just roll this die. Now, on that die, there are three horse head icons, and then there's a saddle icon, a helmet icon, and a horseshoe icon. So, uh, and every single horse has four different attributes that match up with those four things. So every time you roll the die, you have a 50% uh, chance of hitting a horse head, and you have a one in six chance of getting the other three options. Now, after you roll the die, you then move one of the horses according to the number that's associated with the face on the die, and then you flip the horse over so it can't move again until all the horses have moved. So what this means is you have to go into this game with a betting type of excitement atmosphere because you have to roll the die and then, um, you know, get excited about what, um, how that die face went and you have to either move a horse forward that you really care about. Um, maybe you get a uh, helmet and that horse that you bet on goes like eight or nine with the helmet and you're like really excited and you move the horse forward and, you know, maybe somebody else, you know, high fives you because they've been moving that horse as well. And even though your bids are secret, it doesn't take too long to figure out who really cares about which horse. But also, you might roll that die, and it has a horrible die face for all of the horses you care about. So instead, you just flip over a different horse and make it move like one or two spaces forward instead of the 13 it could have gone forward if you had hit a um, horseshoe. And you're fine with that because you didn't bet on that horse. So you can skunk other horses, kind of making them slow down. Now, there's a wide variety of horses in the game. Uh, <laughs> I think my favorite horse is called Regret. Uh, it has awful stats for all but one of its things, but that one that it does, I think it goes like 20 spaces and the track is only... 36, I think, spaces long. So you can have a lot of regrets bidding on that one horse, but if you get lucky and you roll the dice right when you care about that horse and you get that symbol, it's a great moment as the horse just launches way ahead on the track and you keep playing until three horses have crossed the finish line and then you pay out money and then whichever horse is in the very back will actually force the people who bet on it to lose money. Now, that's the game in a nutshell, and I uh, was able to play a full five-player game of this one a couple weeks ago, and I had a pretty good time with it, although I did walk away from that feeling like, yeah, five players is probably a little bit too much. Uh, this is the kind of game where you have to play it fast. You have to, you know, roll the die, make a snap decision, move the horse, keep going. And in that play, we had one or two people who were starting to analysis paralysis on the options, and it was kind of like... Now, come on, this is a horse racing game. They're racing around, like, make a decision, pass the dial, let's keep going, because you want to have an excitement, uh, excited kind of atmosphere, and that can be kind of killed by having a long moments of 
crunchy decision making and what is supposed to be a pretty light horse betting die rolling game. So I am happy that I have this new shiny copy of the game. I don't know how often it will necessarily see play, but I am looking forward to playing this one more. Um, it's a game I've had forever, really, you know, in my board gaming life anyway. It's one of the first games I've had. I've now essentially upgraded into a uh, new, shinier, better uh, version. Um, so the old version is now, I guess, going to uh, pass on. I think I'm going to probably give that away to somebody and tell them that there's a token or two missing in there. But yeah, at the end of the day, I think Winter Circle is still really good. I forgot to mention, this was designed by Reiner Knizia. And if that means anything to you, then you'll know that he has designed a lot of different games and uh, he has done some really good stuff. So yeah, that's going to wrap that one out. I, I've enjoyed playing this one in the past and I'm happy I have a nice fancy version now. Okay, at this point, we've reached the end of this vlog. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope that you found some of these uh, various impressions interesting. As I mentioned at the beginning of the vlog, this is only eight of the 34 new games that I played throughout this month. So um, if you're interested in learning more about lots of new games that I've played recently, then please check out that uh, two-part Board Game Geek Con Impressions vlog that I put out. Uh, again, you can click the little I in the top corner, and that will take you right over to those if you like. So yeah, with that, I think we've finished this one out. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including all of these producer-level Patreon backers. If you too would like to directly support these videos, then please go to johngetsgames.com support to see a variety of ways with which you could do that. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please consider clicking the like button down below as well as the subscribe button. Thanks for watching.